Good morning. I'm not usually here this, uh, this early. Uh, those of you who've known me over the last 17 years or so will understand that, but uh, uh, if I nod off, it's not you. Uh, today we conclude, if you will, a trilogy of Gospels about um, vines and vineyards. And it's important because each story, each telling of these parables in the vineyards has an important message for us as we move forward with our lives and with our faith. Two weeks ago, we learned that it didn't matter how long you've worked in the vineyard, when you first came to the vineyard, when you were called to work in the vineyard, all would be rewarded the same way. Last week, we heard that it doesn't matter what you promise, you will be judged on what you deliver. And today's message is one that's perhaps a little more uh, discreet. It's one of care, responsibility, and follow through. Now, you know, the vineyards are an important part of all three Gospels, but they're really an important part of Scripture entirely. Throughout Scripture, the vineyard is a metaphor for the people of God, how we care for it, how we grow, how we deal with them. And there was a time, you know, when, uh, when that was a metaphor that everybody readily understood. Nowadays, I think even those of us who are ardent, um, ferocious wine drinkers would have a hard time describing a grapevine, let alone a vineyard. But it was something that everybody was familiar with. Either you worked in the vineyard, or you knew somebody who worked in the vineyard, or you lived near the vineyard. It was an image that was always with us. Um, and it remained the same for a long, long time. Let me give you an example. I grew up in an Italian neighborhood outside of Boston. Uh, if you had a grandparent living with you, living next door, upstairs, across the street, or down the block, there were grapevines, and you had really nothing to do about it. Grapevines were growing over the fences, they were trellised, or they were arbored over one corner of the backyard, providing, coincidentally, uh, a respite of uh, cool and shade in the heat of the summer. But they were always there, and they were tended uh, with the uh, intensity of a medieval friar, because these were the these were the vineyards of the grandparents. No matter what, uh, they were going to make wine. They were going to make Nano's wine. And we would not be able to, allowed to drink it for a number of years. And truth be told, this being New England, most of these vineyards were Concord grapes. Now, Concord grapes make a passable jelly. But I can tell you from experience, they make terrible wine. They make the kind of wine that needs to be aged so long that really uh, a generation born after the harvest is finally able to drink it. But that wasn't the point, because that was something that had to be done. And many, in many occasions, this was how the value or the worth of the individual was measured. Now, these Gospels, all three of them to a certain extent, but particularly today, have been interpreted down through the years as aimed at the Pharisees and elders of the people. This is what happens if you don't listen to the word of God. These are the people who heard the message but rejected it and accordingly led the people astray. But you know, a few years, a few days ago rather, uh, we celebrated the feast of uh, St. Francis of Assisi. We know Francis of Assisi uh, as the great lover of uh, animals, great lover of people, great lover of all of God's creation. Uh, it was so marked, uh, particularly by his uh, uh, love of animals, that he's hardly ever depicted without uh, squirrels at his feet, chipmunks, or birds perched on his shoulder or in his hand. It's this sense 
of what Francis was that probably led the Pope in 1939, on the eve of the atrocities of World War II, to declare Francis of Assisi the patron saint of Italy, but more significantly for us today. In 1979, Pope John Paul II declared Francis of Assisi the patron saint of ecologists. It's that love of nature, that love of all of God's creation, and the requirement of care for all of that. Now, I'm, if I was to quibble with John Paul II, and I'll say this quietly, um, I would not have made St. Francis the patron saint of ecologists. I would have made him the patron of ecology. Making him the patron of ecologists is sort of like making him the patron of somebody else who's responsible for this. And what this gospel teaches us today is that we are all responsible. We can't just point to someone and say this is his responsibility. So, given the historical uh, uh, interpretation of these gospels, that one suggests something different today. You know, scripture never changes, but it needs to be reformulated. It needs to be reinterpreted, and the message needs to be made more relevant to the people who are hearing it 2,000 years later. It's nice to talk about vineyards and wine, but it's not really something that's familiar with us. So let me suggest that applying the, if you will, code of St. Francis to today's gospel, let me suggest that today's gospel is about our care and responsibility for all of creation, not just those that we choose to acknowledge, not just to those things that we choose to become aware of. That's what this is all about. As I grew up, you know, what I saw in these um, arbors of uh, conquered grapes were perfectly ripe grapes ready to be eaten but they were not ready to be picked to make wine. And of course, that wouldn't, uh, didn't dissuade me or many of my cousins from taking the occasional um, ripened Concord grape. Now, if any of you are familiar with Concord grapes, you know that uh, trying to take one or two little uh, segments of grapes from the vine tends to ruin a whole section of that vineyard. What you don't get in your hand ends up on the ground for the squirrels, the chipmunks, and the birds. What you end up in your hand, you better enjoy before your grandfather gets home. That's what this is all about. But you know, once the wine was made, once the grapes were harvested, the press was made, the wine by whatever standard was declared ready to be uh, barreled or drunk, all was forgotten because our offense, if you will, was not in eating the grapes, but it was in not caring for the vineyard, and not caring for the, uh, for the grapevine, in ruining that particular section. And once that was done, all was forgiven. Things went on as they usually did. Now, in that telling, the landowners are my grandparents, or grandparents, around town. The tenants were those of us who didn't quite appreciate what the vine was all about. In these parables, the landowner is obviously God. And we are the tenants. We are the ones that, like St. Francis, are entrusted with the care of this vineyard. And we need to make it our responsibility to make it our duty to deliver the vineyards and all its produce to God when he arrives, to the landowner when he comes calling. We tend to forget, as these, you know, these tenants did in today's gospel, they, they may or may not have been good tenants of the vineyard. Matthew doesn't really tell us what exactly was going on, but we know Biblical scholars tell us that at this time, it took about five years for a vineyard to develop to the point where it was productive. And the gospel does tell us that the landowner went on a journey. So these tenants have been without sight of the landowner for at least five years. So it's not a great leap 
to think, as many of us do today, that the landowner has forgotten about us, forgotten about the vineyard, perhaps even died. So it's not a great stretch to assume that these tenants are looking to usurp ownership and that they can do so because they haven't seen the landowner, they haven't seen God in centuries, that they can do so without consequence, without fear of judgment. And that's what this is all about. What St. Francis teaches us is that we are all responsible. And the other thing about these Gospels, as the end of today's Gospel teaches us, is, you know, the kingdom, the kingdom will survive. It will survive with or without us. So our responsibility is to make sure that it survives with us and that there is enough left to present to the landowner, to present to God when he does arrive. So let me, ponder, let me suggest that we ponder two questions as we leave today's gospel. One is, what kind of tenants are we? Are we paying attention to all of God's creation? Are we taking care of the land? Are we taking care of those on it? And secondly, what is it that we will present to God? Should he come as we leave Mass today, tomorrow, for months or years or decades from now? What is our responsibility to all of God's creation? Now, one other thing, um, you know, this is, uh, as we celebrate today, uh, Deacon Sunday. I believe it was the last week we celebrated uh, Priesthood Sunday. Uh, the diaconate has a somewhat fraught history in the church, uh, but the current iteration is uh, since Vatican II with the restoration of the permanent diaconate. And this is also relevant to St. Francis because St. Francis, you know, what does a deacon do? Besides preaching, uh, the deacon assists at weddings, funerals, baptisms, but most importantly, the deacon is the one is a supposed to be charged with visiting the sick, taking care of the widows and the orphans in the scriptural language. Today, or I should say, uh, yeah, 17 years ago when I started here, we had no deacons. We had, I think, on the record, uh, the late Bishop Schultz's late father, who was uh, probably about 90 years old. He was in the first group of uh, deacons ordained since the uh, restoration of the diaconate in the Archdiocese, or then Diocese of Galveston, Houston. Today, we have uh, three deacons. One of us is retired. And we have one in formation in this parish, which is unusual. Uh, for some reason, the uh, vineyards of deacons is uh, quite prolific outside of uh, 610 and uh, the Beltway. It's never been so inside, so we should celebrate the fact that we are a growing number uh, here uh, inside the loop. But when you think of all that a deacon is supposed to do, you think of St. Francis, that humble service to God, to his creation, and to all of his creation. You know, how many of you know, think that St. Francis was a priest? Nobody's thinking this morning. St. Francis was not a priest. We, understand, we assume that because he founded an order of friars, that like most other saints who founded orders of men, um, he was a priest. But if anything, he was a deacon. And his service to God and to God's creation mirrors that. So as we go forward today, um, let's keep that in mind, that the humble the example of Francis's humble service to God and to his creation is one that, yes, marks the deacons, or should mark the deacons, but it's one that should also mark all of us, each and every one of us, as we go forward.